welcome. My name is Sherry Niles from Hattie's Honey Apiaries and Being With Mom. And I've been invited today by the folks at the Carrie Lane Chapman Cat Childhood Home and Museum to present for your virtual day camp. I'm really excited to talk to you today about bees. And hopefully you will learn a little something and you will get to know the joys of beekeeping and honey. So, are you ready to get started? Shall we? There are three types of bees. There are the worker bees, the drone bees, and the queen bee. You'll notice that the worker bee is the smallest bee of the bees within the colony. Um, they make up the majority of the percentage of bees. They are between 30,000 and 50,000 worker bees in any given bee colony. Um, these are the bees that do, like it says, all of the work within the hive. They clean out the hive, they take care of the babies, they feed the babies, um, they take care of the drone bees and the queen bee. They guard the entrance, they forage for food, they just general workers. Next is the drone bee. The drone bee exists to mate with the queen during her mating flight so that the queen has fertilized eggs to be able to lay to produce more worker bees. Um, so. This is the queen, obviously. She's the biggest of the three bees, and you'll notice that her abdomen is elongated, and that elongated abdomen allows her to lay eggs in the bottom of the honeycomb so that the baby bees, once they hatch out of the egg, become larva and then become pupa, and then finally emerge from the hive as a, um, as a bee, as a new bee. Um, there's one queen bee, uh, numerous drone bees and lots and lots of worker bees within the colony. I have a picture of one of my actual queen bees. It's right here in the middle if you can see that. See how big she is compared to the rest of the bees? Right? She's surrounded by worker bees, but you'll also notice down here, right here with the little rounded bottom, here's another one, are the drone bees. So you can actually see the difference between the bees that are in the colony. They all have different jobs and they have to produce their jobs to be able to keep the, keep the hive running, okay? Um, and so we talked a little bit about the queen bee in the hive laying eggs. And so this photo will show you some of the stages of the queens laying in the hive. This is a picture of one of my hives. You have dark cells here that actually have eggs in the bottom of them or tiny, tiny larva. And then you have larger larva in some of these cells that you can see the white. And then the exciting part is, is this one right here in the middle. This is actually a larva that is about to be capped by the worker bees and then will turn into a pupa and then will emerge by chewing through the cap. As you see, these are capped. Chewing through the cap and come out to be a worker bee. Okay. So, how do the bees make honey? That's a big question. Well, it's a simple answer and a complicated answer all at once. Um, this half pint jar of honey takes approximately the hive the entire season, visiting over a million flowers to be able to produce this much honey. It takes the worker bees to support the colony. They go out and they find trees that are producing nectar or plants that are producing nectar and they collect this nectar in a sack behind their throat called a nectar sack. This nectar sack has an enzyme in it and so when the bees actually swallow the nectar and it goes into the nectar sack to come back to the hive with it, there's enzymes working on that nectar. They come back to the hive, they meet with the hive bees, they actually sort of spit up the nectar out of the nectar sack and give it to the bees from the hive who swallow it and have it in their nectar sack. These inside bees then take it up into the hive and they again spit it up and put it into a honey cell where it is fanned until it dehydrates enough to be the consistency of honey and then capped. So if you can see in my picture, down here, it's kind of sparkly in these cells. That is the nectar that they have collected and put into those cells that they're waiting to dehydrate and then cap. This over here is capped honey, which means it has come to the right consistency and the right moisture content for the bees to be able to cap it and store it and preserve it then for honey and food for later on in the season. Now, 
We also talked about pollen. The bees have to collect the pollen because they actually make something called bee bread with the pollen that they then feed the larva to produce the other worker bees and the other drone bees. So the worker bees and the forage bees are very, very important. Um, one of the things that somebody has asked me is what happens when you get stung by a bee? And that's a really good question. Although we don't like to get stung, <laughs> it happens. Um, I had a bee that got between my glove and my suit, my bee suit, and he stung me just a couple days ago. When a bee stings you, what happens is they have a stinger attached to the bottom of their abdomen and it's barbed. So when it sticks you, it actually pulls away then and the stinger is left in your skin and the bee kills himself by stinging you. Well, a bee doesn't want to do this unless it's doing it to protect its hive, its baby, its home. Just like you would. You would do anything you needed to protect your hive, your home, and your babies. And the same thing is, is true of the bees. Now, on the end of the stinger is a little tiny sack. And that little tiny sack actually has what's called bee venom in it. It's nothing that the majority of us can't tolerate. Only those that are allergic to bee stings will find this very harmful. Of the rest of us, it's just, it's an irritation. So if you see a bee or a bee comes near you, just a single bee, don't get worried about it. It's trying to find food and it's going to sniff around you a little bit. And once it discovers that you don't have pollen or nectar to help it out, it's going to fly away and leave you alone. If you smack at it, if you try and bat it away, it will think that you are being aggressive with it and you're a threat and it will try and sting you. So just leave it alone and or walk away from it and it will leave you alone and not sting you. So what happens during the rest of the year? Just like us during the spring, the summer and the fall, the bees like to be outside. But during the winter time, what happens to the bees? Do they hibernate like the bears? No. Do they all die off in the winter time? Well, you hope not. But what happens? Inside the hive, this is a representation of a hive. Inside the hive, the bees cluster together in a small ball in the middle of the hive. And then they work to keep the inside of the hive at 95 degrees Fahrenheit because they need to be able to keep all of the bees alive in that cluster and the queen bee. So they cluster around the queen. And depending on how what the temperature is outside the box. They either get closer to the queen or farther away from the queen and they flap their wings to create heat within the hive. Now, most of us keep our houses in the winter time somewhere between 70 and 75 degrees. And the bees are actually keeping the hive outside without insulation at 95 degrees. And so they have a lot of work and they expend a lot of energy in the winter time. And this is one of the reasons why the bees sometimes don't actually survive winter. A hive will die in the winter time because it doesn't have enough bees to generate the amount of heat that they need and they freeze to death, which is unfortunate. Um, bees are pretty cool. Uh, they pollinate. And I'm sure that you've heard a lot about what happens when we don't have pollinators in our world. Because one out of every three bites of food that we eat is directly in accordance with the fact that the bees have, the bees have pollinated something somewhere along the way. For instance, I like ice cream, especially in the summertime when it's hot. I like ice cream. Now you wouldn't think that we have ice cream because bees pollinated something, but that's actually not true. Ice cream comes from milk. Milk comes from cows. Cows have to eat grains in order to produce the milk. The grains are produced because the grains were pollinated by pollinators to be able to produce things like corn and wheat and soybeans. And so, if we didn't have pollinators producing the pollination for the grains, we might not have ice cream. And so it's really important for us to all learn about the bees and learn about how we can better help the bees and support the bees. And one of the things that we need to learn about is something called colony collapse disorder. And this is a, 
this is a prevalent problem because it means that there are mass die-offs of hives across the world and that means we don't have pollinators like we used to. What's causing the colony collapse disorder? Well, there's probably a lot of things, but one of the main reasons why colony collapse disorder happens is because we have so many chemicals that we treat our food products with. So if a farmer is out in the field and he treats his crop with a chemical, the bees come and pollinate, they collect pollen from that plant. Some of the pollen that they collect is going to be infected with that chemical. So the bees bring the chemical back to the hive and they actually use that pollen to make beeswax. And I have something to show you. So this is a frame from a hive and this is beeswax that the bees have actually produced. Now, when you look at this, you'll notice that some of this is lighter and some of this is darker. That doesn't mean that this doesn't have any chemical in it and this does. What this means is that the dark spot is where the baby bees have been raised. It's called the brood. And so these are where the baby bees were. And then outside the baby bees in the lighter is where the honey was stored. Well, bees reuse this comb where the, where the babies are born and raised. And the problem is, is that they bring back the pollen that has the chemical on it. They use it to create this, this bee comb and the bee comb actually has the chemical in it. And so your baby bees are being raised in a toxic environment. And although it might not kill the baby bees right off, it produces weaker and weaker and weaker bees the more times that the babies are raised in this environment. And so actually right now they're saying that bees shouldn't use brood comb, this comb, they should have to rebuild it every three years so that the chemical is not next to the babies. Um, it's tough, it's very difficult because the bees have to use a lot of energy and a lot of their pollen and their nectar that they would be storing for the winter to keep them over the winter, then they have to reuse to make the new places for the baby bees. So colony collapse disorder is basically chemicals that are stored in the wax where the baby bees are raised and it weakens the baby bees with each generation of bees that's raised in it. So now we have to talk about what we can do. Now, obviously I'm a beekeeper, so I actually try and support my beehives by giving them good things to eat, lots of nectar plants to go to, lots of pollen that they can collect in an environment that's not close to any chemicals that they can bring back to the hive. But not everybody can do that, and I understand. I also understand that farmers need to be able to use some chemicals on their crops. So it has to be a balancing act. And that balancing act has to be, can we find chemicals that don't harm the bees, first of all, or can we limit the amount of chemical that gets on the pollen that the bees bring in? One of the things in Iowa is an, an initiative called No Mow May. Now, this year, of course, we started mowing our lawns late April, beginning of May. And one of the first food products that the bees actually have to be able to collect pollen and collect ne nectar is from the dandelion, the lowly dandelion. And yet, we like our lawns to be green with no dandelions. We like our fields to be green with no dandelions. And so we spray those dandelions or we cut those off. And what we're doing is we're taking away a, an easy, easy food source for those bees when they're just emerging in the springtime and they don't have access to other trees that are blooming or other plants that are blooming. So if you hold off mowing your lawn for a couple weeks in May, that allows the bees to be able to collect that nectar, that pollen without the chemical on it. We can plant other things that are good for the bees in our flower gardens, in our yards, in our gardens. And so this is a list of native Iowa plants that actually help the bees collect nectar and nectar and pollen to produce the honey and to support their hives through the winter. So what can we do to help keep the bees alive 
to diminish colony collapse disorder and to have ice cream to be able to eat whenever we want it. We can support the bees. We can plant native Iowa plants that promote nectar and pollen. We can ask our farmer friends to not use the chemicals that are damaging to our hives. We can stop mowing our lawns in May so that those bees have that resource for them to be able to collect their food. You can buy local honey. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of honey in stores right now that has high fructose corn syrup in it, which helps no bees anywhere along the line um, and is really not very good for you. So look for your local honey provider and buy honey. Thank you so much for your time and your attention today. I hope that I have provided you a little bit of information about bees and honey and what happens for bees to make honey and why it's important for us to help support the bees. If you have any questions, my email is at the bottom of the screen. You can certainly email me and I will try and get back to you with answers on those questions and find honey, local honey from a local producer.